Hey everybody, I'm Adam Shell, the pastor at Melbourne Heights, and I want to welcome you as we come together to worship online today. And as we get started, I want to encourage everyone who's joining us today to interact with us throughout our time together. Now, the first way that you can do that is to just go ahead and hit the share button on this post if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. By sharing this post, you'll be inviting your friends to come and worship with us and to come and worship with you today. You can also use the emojis if you're worshiping with us on Facebook right now to let us know when you like something that was said or when you love a song that we sing or if something just makes you laugh. And yeah, I know that just by clicking on one of those emojis, it's not the same as being able to worship face to face together. But whenever we see a little thumbs up or a heart or a laughing face go floating by on our screen, it reminds us that we're still worshiping God together. So use those. I also want to encourage you to use the comments thread to share your thoughts or ask questions that you may have while we're together. And if you do have a question, I want you to know that I take a little bit of time every Monday in our church's private Facebook group to answer those questions. And that's not all that we do in this Facebook group either. This group is our virtual campus uh, right now, so it's a place where we can interact and get to know each other better throughout the week. You can join that group by visiting facebook.com slash groups slash Melbourne Heights. Now, in just a second, I'm going to turn it over to our Minister of Music, Leslie Brocklesby, and our church musicians to lead us in worship through song. But first, let's join together in a time of prayer led by one of our deacons, Ken Orr. Hello, my name is Ken Orr. I am a deacon and a small group leader here at Melbourne Heights. Please take a moment to pray with me. Lord our God, wherever we may be and even at whatever time that we may be viewing this, we ask that your grace and your presence would be with us, to help us know that you are one God and one spirit and one savior ministering in all places and in all times. May your grace be with us. May we be reminded that you care about us May you help us to think about your presence with us, but also be mindful that you have the power to intervene in ways that no one else can. And while we see a world around us that may be feel, filled with many difficulties, those difficulties are not nearly as great when you are with us. And so we ask, your grace, and your presence as we look to you for your word and your guidance. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Good morning and welcome to worship. Let's praise our great God together.
So last week, we started into a new series of sermons where we're talking about the life of the prophet Elijah. And we're talking about the life of Elijah because the world that Elijah lived in, well, it isn't that different than the world that we're living in right now. You see, during Elijah's lifetime, the nation of Israel went from a time of prosperity to a time of struggle, just like we've been experiencing in 2020 so far. So we're taking a closer look at a few stories from Elijah's life to see how Elijah made it through. But before we get into this week's story from Elijah's life, I have another story that I want to tell you. And since school started back up this week right here in Louisville, Kentucky, it seems like the right time to tell you a story that takes place during a school science fair. Now, at one point or another, most of us have either participated in a science fair ourselves or we've had kids or grandkids that did. So we know what usually happens at a science fair. You know that there are going to be baking soda volcanoes at a science fair, and there are going to be styrofoam solar systems at a science fair, and there are going to be potato-powered light bulbs at a science fair. And since most of these projects look similar from year to year, it's actually pretty rare to remember a science fair project after it's been completed. But every now and again, there's a project that comes along that you just can't forget. Like the science fair project that Nathan Zoner, a student at Eagle Rock Junior High School, came up with way back in 1997. So what is it about Nathan's project that makes it memorable more than 20 years later? Well, Nathan had been studying the environment for his project, and he came across a chemical that seemed to be causing a lot of harm not only to the planet, but also to human life. And as he scoured the internet to find more information, which wasn't exactly easy when Nathan completed his project since it happened about a year before Google even existed, he was able to compile a list of just how destructive this chemical could be. Nathan learned that this particular chemical can cause excess sweating and vomiting in human beings, and that if it is inhaled, it can kill you. In addition, this chemical has been found in the tumors of terminal cancer patients, and it's also a major component of acid rain. This chemical can cause severe burns in its gaseous state, and it's a major contributor to erosion as well. And if all of those things weren't bad enough, Nathan also learned that this chemical can decrease the effectiveness of the brakes in your car. So armed with all of this information about these dangerous effects, Nathan created an urgent petition that demanded more strict control over this chemical called dihydrogen monoxide, if not its total elimination. Now, Nathan finished his research a little late in the game, and again, this experiment took place back in 1997, long before you could just visit a site like change.org and create an online petition that could reach millions of people, potentially. But he still wanted to do his part, so he took his petition, his petition directly to his peers. He was only able to ask 50 of his fellow students to sign the petition before the deadline for the science fair. But out of the 50 people that he asked, 43 of them gladly signed on to eliminate dihydrogen monoxide and its potential dangers. Now, as the judges for the Greater Idaho Fall Science Fair made their rounds, they were blown away by Nathan's project, and they quickly awarded his project with top honors. Now, if you want to learn more about Nathan and his Science Fair project, let me encourage you to Google it. But to help you find it, you probably need to know the name of this particular project. Well, Nathan Zoner called his science fair project, How Gullible Are We? And he called this project, How Gullible Are We? Because Nathan didn't discover some new chemical compound that was out there wreaking havoc all across the globe. What Nathan was really trying to do with his project was to shed a little bit of light on alarmists who practice junk science and try to spread fear and distrust with their messages. And Nathan did this by showing the dangers of dihydrogen, which is two hydrogen atoms, that are fused together with monoxide, or one oxygen atom. So dihydrogen monoxide is a chemical compound that's better known as H2O, 
or plain old ordinary water. That's right. The dangerous chemical that Nathan based his entire science fair project on was water. You know, the most common chemical compound on the planet. The same stuff that covers about 70% of the Earth's surface. The same water that makes up about 60% of the average human body. The same water that flowed out of your shower head while you were getting cleaned up before coming to church online this morning. The same water that you used to brew up your morning coffee today. The same water that you use when you brush your teeth every day. It was just plain old ordinary water. And water? Well, it's something that we just take for granted. I mean, did you know that the average American family uses 300 gallons of water every single day? To help put that in perspective for you, if you use 300 gallons of gas every day, it would set you back about a quarter of a million dollars a year to keep your tank full. Or if you bought 300 gallons of milk every day, you'd be handing over about $3,000 a week to your favorite grocery store. Or to put it in a more global perspective, the average American family uses 60 times more water each day than the average family in Africa does. In Africa, the average family survives on only about five gallons of water a day. Now, we're gonna get back to Nathan's story a little bit later on today, but I do wanna take just a minute here to point out that our access to water today makes it almost impossible for us to understand the background for our scripture reading for this morning. Why? Because as this story begins, there has been a drought in Israel for about three years. That's right. Not a single drop of water has fallen from the sky for almost 1,100 days. So by the time this story takes place, the land is barren, the food supply is running out, cattle and livestock are slowly withering away. But why had there been a three-year drought in Israel? Well, that's really where our story for today begins. You see, our story takes place more than 50 years after Solomon sat on the throne of Israel during Israel's great golden era. And over those 50 years, disputes over the throne had led the nation of Israel to split into two different kingdoms. You have 10 of the original tribes that joined together to form the Northern Kingdom, which we refer to as Israel. And then you have the other two tribes that form the Southern Kingdom, which we refer to as Judah. Now, a man named Ahab becomes the ruler of the Northern Kingdom, and he rules over the Northern Kingdom for 22 years. But even though he reigns for more than two decades, Ahab isn't exactly a good king. As a matter of fact, 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 33 tells us that Ahab did more to make the Lord, the God of Israel, angry than all the other kings before him. So what kind of things did Ahab do? Well, the biggest thing that he did was marry Jezebel, who was the daughter of the king of Sidon. And even though their marriage was a shrewd political decision on Ahab's part, because it created an important alliance between these two countries, it wasn't really a good decision for the nation of Israel. You see, when Jezebel married Ahab, she brought the gods of her home country with her to Israel. And it didn't take long before Ahab started worshiping Jezebel's gods instead of the one true God. And once Israel's king had turned his back on God, well, the entire nation would follow his example. So Israel turned away from their God, the God who created the universe, the God who freed their ancestors from slavery, the God who had given them great kings like David and Solomon. And the people of Israel started worshiping Jezebel's gods instead. Now, the specific gods that the people of Israel started worshiping were the gods of Baal and Asherah. And both of these gods were fertility gods. So to demonstrate who is really God, the God of Israel, our God, decided to dry up the rain to keep the land from being fertile at all. And just in case there is three years without a single drop of rain, wasn't enough to convince the people of Israel that their God was the one true God? Well, Elijah is going to set up a challenge. And that's the story that we're going to find in our scripture reading for today. So let's take a look together at 1 Kings chapter 18. And we're going to start reading in verse 20. Here's what it says. 
Ahab sent the message to all the Israelites. He gathered the prophets at Mount Carmel. Elijah approached all the people and said, How long will you hobble back and forth between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow God. If Baal is God, follow Baal. The people gave no answer. Elijah said to the people, I am the last of the Lord's prophets, but Baal's prophets number 450. So give us two bulls. Let Baal's prophets choose one. Let them cut it apart and set it on the wood, but don't add fire. I'll prepare the other bull. Put it on the wood, but won't add fire. Then all of you will call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers with fire, that's the real God. All the people answered, that's an excellent idea. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of these bulls, prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but don't add fire. So they took one of the bulls that had been brought to them. They prepared it and called on Baal's name from morning to midday. They said, great Baal, answer us. But there was no sound or answer. They performed a hopping dance around the altar that had been set up. Around noon, Elijah started making fun of them. Shout louder. Certainly he's a god. Maybe he's lost in thought or wandering or traveling somewhere. Or maybe he's asleep and you have to wake him up. So the prophets of Baal cried with a louder voice and cut themselves with swords and knives, as was their custom. Their blood flowed all over them. As noon passed, they went crazy with their ritual until it was time for the evening offering. Still, there was no sound or answer, no response whatsoever. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here. All the people closed in, and he repaired the Lord's altar that had been damaged. Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the Lord's word came. Your name will be Israel. He built the stones into an altar in the Lord's name, and he dug a trench around it. It was wide enough and deep enough to hold about four gallons of water. He put the wood in order, butchered the bull, and then he placed the bull on the wood. Fill four jars with water and pour it on the sacrifice and on the wood, he commanded. Do it a second time, he said. So they did it a second time. Do it a third time. And so they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar, and even the trench filled with water. At the time of the evening offering, the prophet Elijah drew near and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. I have done all these things at your instructions. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so that this people will know that you, Lord, are the real God and that you can change their hearts. Then the Lord's fire fell. It consumed the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up the water in the trench. All the people saw this and fell on their faces. The Lord is the real God. The Lord is the real God, they exclaimed. After a while, the sky became dark with clouds, and a wind came up with a huge rainstorm. So as this story begins, there hasn't been a single drop of rain in Israel for three long years. The land has dried up. The rivers, the streams, the lakes have all virtually disappeared. The grass, the flowers, the trees, they've all withered away. So how do you think the people of Israel felt about God before this story started? I think they all must have felt abandoned by God. And we've all felt abandoned by God, too. We've all felt abandoned by God, too. Some of us are feeling that way because of the toll that COVID-19 has taken on our world. To date, there have been nearly 20 million confirmed cases of COVID-19, and it's contributed to the deaths of three quarters of a million people worldwide. It's easy to look at those numbers especially if you or someone you love has been affected by this virus and feel like you've been abandoned. 
or for many of our church members who have consciously chosen to stay at home as much as possible over the last five months, essentially cutting themselves off from just about everyone else in the world, well, it's easy to feel like you've been abandoned too. Or for all of us that have been missing seeing each other for in-person services and activities since March the 8th, it's easy to feel abandoned. But what the people of Israel don't realize in this story is that God had not abandoned them. They had abandoned God. God had not abandoned the people of Israel. The people of Israel had abandoned God. They were the ones that had turned their attention away from God. They were the ones that were focused on the gods of Baal and Asherah instead. They were the ones that were focused on the gods that Jezebel had brought with her from Sidon. They were the ones that were focused on the gods that their king Ahab had started worshiping. They were the ones that were focused on all the wrong things. You know, that's exactly what happened to the story that I told you earlier about Nathan's owner science fair project. Nathan convinced his classmates to focus on the wrong part of his project. He convinced them to focus on the dangerous effects of a chemical compound instead of looking at what that chemical actually was. So Nathan essentially tricked 43 out of his 50 classmates into signing his petition by getting them to focus on the wrong thing. But the other seven people in his class, well, they didn't entirely buy it. Six of them weren't convinced to sign the petition just because of what Nathan had found. And one person in his class actually got the joke. They paid attention to what Nathan was presenting. And if the people of Israel had just been focused on the right thing, they would have seen what was really happening too. They would have seen that God had not abandoned them. They would have seen that God was always with them. God was just waiting for them to call on him, but the people of Israel never did. So they stood out in their fields and they complained that their crops weren't growing, but they never turned to God. And they grumbled that there wasn't enough water for them to take a bath and get cleaned up, but they never turned to God. And they fussed when their lips started cracking because there just wasn't enough humidity in the air anymore, but they never turned to God. And they whined when their grocery bills got higher because there wasn't enough supply left to meet the demand. But they never turned to God. And then, lo and behold, the people of Israel flocked to Mount Carmel for a showdown between the gods of Baal and the God of Israel. They watch as the prophets of Baal prepare their sacrifice and then beg and plead for their gods to send down a fire to consume it. For hours on end, they watch, and for hours on end, nothing happens. And it's because their focus is still in the wrong place. But Elijah's going to change that. He takes his turn. He places his bowl upon the altar, and then he does the unthinkable. He drenches the whole thing with water. And that was a crazy enough thing to do when you remember that you use water to put out fire. But it was even crazier when you remember that there had been no water in Israel for three years. And now Elijah had just wasted gallons of the stuff. But with his altar and sacrifice, and even the ground around it soaking wet, Elijah calls upon God. And boom, the fire comes down. And it doesn't take years, it doesn't take months, it doesn't even take minutes. In an instant, the fire comes down and the sacrifice, along with the altar, the grass, the water, and everything around it, are consumed. And as soon as that happens, the people of Israel fall down on their knees and they worship God. Because they realize that God never abandoned them. And as soon as they started worshiping God, the rain started to fall. And the drought that had lasted for three years came to an end. Right now, I think a lot of us are a lot like the Israelites were back then. When we face difficult times in our lives, like what we're facing right now because of the coronavirus, we focus on every little thing happening around us. But we lose our focus on God. So I want to encourage you to try something different. 
Instead of getting anxious because of the tolls that this virus is taking on our world, instead of complaining about being required to wear face masks in the middle of summer, instead of grumbling that you still can't find Clorox wipes when you go to the grocery store, instead of fussing that church still hasn't got back to normal and that we're still worshiping online, I want to challenge you to turn your focus back to God. Now, if you've joined our Facebook group, Melbourne Heights Online, then you know that our group focuses on prayer requests one day every single week. That day just happens to be Thursday. But starting this week, we want to have a day where you can share the good things that God is doing in your life. And those good things, well, they can be anything. It could be answers to some of your prayer requests. It could be something that you learn during your small group's Zoom meeting on Sunday. It could be the way that Sunday sermons spoke to you. It could be anything good that God is doing in your life. So starting this Tuesday, we want you to share the good things that you see God doing. Because in difficult times, we don't need to lose our focus. We don't want to feel like we've been abandoned by God. Because we haven't. God is always with us. God is always with you. We just need to stay focused on God. Let's pray together. God, as we come to you in this word of prayer, we thank you for the story of Elijah and the showdown on Mount Carmel. God, we saw in the story that for three years, the people of Israel turned their attention and their focus to everything but you. So they felt like you had abandoned them, God. But you didn't. You never left them. You never forsook them. You were waiting. Waiting for them to turn back to you. God, as soon as the people turned back to you, the drought that they suffered came to an end. God, you know everything that's happening in our world right now. And you know that there are a million little things that we can focus in on. We can focus in on the pain and the suffering that's happening around us. We can focus in on the, the hardships that have been placed upon each of our lives. We can focus in on the social distancing measures that we have to follow and the impact that that's made on our daily lives. But God, the more we focus on those things, the less we focus on you. So we feel like you've abandoned us, God. But you haven't gone anywhere. You're still there waiting for us to turn to you. So God, challenge us to put our focus back in the right spot, to pay attention to you and all that you were doing in our lives. Let us share the good news of what you were doing for us with each other to remind us that you've not abandoned us. You are with us. You will always be with us, no matter what. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. At this point in the service each week, we put this slide up on the screen to let you know how you can financially support our church. We also like to take this time to remind you of the work and the ministry that we're doing in our church right now. Throughout this pandemic, one of our biggest focuses in our ministry has been making regular contact with our church members and our regular attenders. So each week, myself, the rest of our staff, and our deacons, we pick up our phones to make calls or shoot text messages or send emails, or sometimes we even mail cards just to stay in touch with you to make sure that you're doing okay. We're also also using our private Facebook group right now as a place where you can share about what's happening in your life. So every Thursday we give you time to share your prayer requests and on Thursday afternoons I do a live video where I pray with you and I pray for you. And of course, we're also continuing our work with the Cabbage Patch House right now. Just this past week, Doug Home, our contact there, stopped by our church to pick up a car full of supplies. We've been collecting back-to-school supplies for the patch for just about a month. But while he was here, I asked Doug about what the most pressing needs at the patch are right now. And he told me the most pressing needs are in their pantry once again. So we're going to be shifting our focus away from collecting school supplies back to collecting non-perishable food items and personal hygiene items to keep the patch's pantry stocked. So I'd encourage you to prayerfully consider how you would like to support the work in the ministry of our church and then visit mhbclouisville.com slash give. Now, let me turn it back over to Leslie and our musicians as they lead us in our closing song.
before we go, I just want to thank you for joining us for worship this morning. And if you've been blessed by our time together, let me ask you to hit the share button on this post if you haven't done that already. Now, next week, we're going to continue exploring the life of Elijah. And specifically, we'll be looking at what happens to Elijah after the showdown on Mount Carmel. And we'll see how Elijah responds to everything that God had just done. I also want to remind you about what's happening at Melbourne Heights today. Almost three years ago, our church made the difficult decision to sell our property and to relocate. We did that because the cost of owning and maintaining our building was keeping us from being the church that God has called us to be. Well, our sale is almost finalized. So we're giving you the chance to come back to our building one last time to say goodbye today. You can stop by at the top of the hour from noon until 5 p.m. today. And we are asking that you follow proper social distancing protocols while you're here. We expect that you're going to wear a mask and that you'll stay six feet apart, and we will limit the capacity at any one time. But if you'd like to come by and see the building one more time, we want you to know that you can do that. Now, that's all that I've got for today. So let's join together one more time in a word of prayer before we finish up. Let's pray together. God, as always, we thank you for the opportunity that we had to come together today to worship you. And God, we thank you for this story that we've heard today, the story about the showdown on Mount Carmel and what happened in Elijah's life, God. We know that you are always there for us, but God, sometimes we lose our focus. So my prayer for all of us today is that you help us to stay focused on you. Let us see what you are doing in our lives right now. Let us remember what you have done in the past and let us look forward to what you will do in the future. And as our time comes to an end today, God, we simply pray that you watch over each of us, protect us, keep us healthy, and keep us safe. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for worshiping with us today, and we will see you back here next Sunday for another time to worship together.